There's a Wolf in the Classroom by Bruce Weedy and Patricia Tucker. Introduction, The Gray Wolf, A Natural History. Contrary to what's been said about them in folklore, fairy tales, stories, and movies, wolves are not dangerous to people. Even the wildlife biologists come near their food or pups, wolves back away and act shy and unaggressive. The movie and book Never Cry Wolf showed wolves making a living by eating mice. While wolves do eat mice and small rodents, they're like an after-school snack to you. Appetizing, but not enough to live on. Wolves mostly eat large animals such as deer, elk, caribou, musk ox, bison, and moose. Wolves weigh 60 to 130 pounds. A moose can easily weigh 1,000 pounds. Teeth are the only thing that a wolf has to bring down a large animal like a moose. Imagine yourself waking up to an animal as big as a horse and trying to take a bite out of him. Is he going to sit there and let you make lunch out of him? No way! He's going to kick and stomp. It's not uncommon for a wolf to be hurt or killed while hunting. This is why wolves try to find the old, sick, weak, and young prey animals, which won't be as dangerous as healthy animals. This is also why wolves hunt in a group, their strength in numbers. A group of wolves is called a pack. A pack is a family of wolves, not just a group of wolves that say, hey, it's Friday night, let's go out for a hunt. There are 4 to 15 wolves in a pack. Pack size depends on what the wolves prey on. A large animal such as an elk or moose is more difficult and dangerous to bring down than a smaller animal such as a deer. There are more wolves in the pack the larger animals a pack can hunt. If wolves hunt deer, they tend to live in a smaller pack. Wolves that hunt elk or moose need to live in larger packs. A pack of wolves lives in a territory that is 5 to 2,000 square miles in size. The size of a territory depends on the number of prey animals that live there. Wolves communicate in a number of ways that includes facial expressions and the way they hold their tails and ears. They also leave messages by scent marking on stumps and shrubs with urine. The form of communication that wolves are famous for is howling. Wolves howl to locate members of their pack, to warn strange wolves to stay out of their territory, and as a ceremony that helps the wolves feel closer to each other. Who knows, maybe the wolves howl for fun, too. Sometimes wolves kill livestock. In Alberta and British Columbia, Canada, where thousands of wolves live near cattle, they kill less than one cow out of a thousand. Well, that isn't very many cows. People who want wolves brought back to the places where they once lived need to understand the concerns of individual ranchers who lose cattle. The animals that provide their living to wolves. On the other hand, people who don't like wolves need to understand that the majority of Americans, two-thirds, want wolves to be brought back. We live in a democracy. Both sides need to listen and respect each other's opinions and work towards solutions. Shouting at each other never solves anything. It only causes more problems and misunderstandings. Chapter 1. In the Beginning The tiny black wolf squirmed in Pat's arms. A whimper came from the bundle of soft fur. The two-week-old pup nuzzled blindly for the nipple of the bottle. She found it and sucked greedily as milk dribbled down her chin. Pat watched the pup's belly swell with warm milk and noticed a pair of eyes staring up at her. Pat explained, Look, her eyes just opened. Like many young mammals, the pup's eyes were blue. Later, the eyes would change to the piercing yellow that wolves are famous for. The first thing the pup ever saw was Pat. The second thing she saw was Bruce. After the pup finished feeding, Bruce rubbed her fat belly with a warm, wet washcloth. This helped the pup's digestion process. In the wild, the wolf's mother's warm, wet tongue would do this. Bruce set the pup down in the playpen, where she promptly fell asleep, snuggled in with her brothers and sister. Like most wolves in the United States, outside of Alaska, these pups were born in captivity, in a protected area. The five pups were going to be a part of a television documentary about wolves. Wolves bond, or form close relationships, with their pack members at a very young age. They are cautious and suspicious of strange things. Wolves that live in captivity, where the people will be part of their lives, need to bond with the people or they will be scared and unhappy. Because of this, the pups have been separated from their mother at the age of two weeks old. 
That way, they would grow up to feel comfortable around humans. In the wild, pups are constantly with their mother for the first four weeks of their lives. After that, the entire pack helps raise the pups. Wild pups wouldn't be alone until they are at at least six months old. For the next couple of weeks, the young pups need to be fed every four hours. The alarm clock buzzed at the middle of the night. Pat and Bruce woke up. With eyes nearly closed from sleepiness, they warmed milk on the stove, filled bottles, and stumbled to the playpen full of hungry pups. One day, the television filmmaker said, Pat, you are a wildlife biologist and Bruce is a storyteller. You both know how to teach children about wolves. Would you raise one of the pups so that I can film you taking it to classrooms? That would be a big responsibility, said Pat. We need to think about it. Bruce and Pat talked about the job of living with a wolf. After all, it could live to the age of 15. All its life, the wolf would be like a curious and unruly two-year-old human child with sharp teeth and powerful jaws. Bruce and Pat also realized that raising a wolf could be dangerous. Not because wolves are vicious, but because some people are. Politicians, ranchers, environmentalists, hunters, and others had begun arguing over whether or not wolves should be returned to Yellowstone, the world's first national park. Wolves used to live in Yellowstone National Park until they were exterminated, hunted until no longer left alive, about 50 years ago. In fact, wolves once ranged throughout most of North America. But when Europeans first sailed across the Atlantic Ocean to settle in a new land that would become the United States, they brought their fear and hatred of wolves with them. Everywhere they went, they trapped, poisoned, and shot wolves. In the late 1800s, ranchers hired men called wolfers to do one job, kill as many wolves as they could. By the 1930, all the wolves in the lower 48 states, the United States except for Alaska and Hawaii, were dead except for some that lived in a large wilderness area in northern Minnesota. Half a century later, attitudes towards the wolf began to change. Some people realized that the big bad wolf existed only in stories. Wildlife biologists studied wolves, and people learned that wolves weren't evil animals. Many Americans wanted wolves returned to Yellowstone, brought back there, and allowed to live freely. However, Pat and Bruce knew that many people still hated wolves because they misunderstood them. Some people believed that wolves killed lots of cows and sheep. Other people still believed that wolves ate humans. Most people who hated wolves had never seen one except for in their imaginations. Some people hate wolves so much they might try to kill the wolf we're raising, said Pat. We'd have to be very protective. Some of those people are mad enough about wolves to want to kill us, added Bruce. But if wolves were ever going to run wild and free in the northern Rockies again, people need to learn what they're really like. Finally, Pat and Bruce made a decision. We'll do it, they told the filmmaker. Which pup do you think would be best, he responded. Pat looked down at the three black and two gray pups that rustled and played on the floor. She pointed at the pup pulling on her brother's tail. Let's take that playful black pup. A lot of people think black wolves are different from gray or white wolves. We can help people understand that color doesn't make any difference in wolves, just like humans. What shall we name her? asked Bruce. The three of them sat there and thought about names. Kawani, said the filmmaker. That means play in the language of Blackfeet Native Americans. She is playful, said Pat. When she grows up, Kawani will be a teacher, said the filmmaker. The three of you can help the students learn that wolves aren't big and bad. Chapter 2. Indy, a legend in his own mind. A few weeks later, Kawani arrived at her new home in Montana. Bruce and Pat had worked hard to prepare a secure place for Kawani to live. A ten-foot-tall fence surrounded an area almost the size of a football field. Aspens and pine trees provided shade. A stream flowed through it. A shelter filled with sweet straw gave her a place to sleep during rainy days. An elevated platform allowed her to look out over her surroundings. Gwani explored her pen with Pat and Bruce. She romped and played in the tall grass and cool stream, but something was missing. The minute Bruce and Pat left the pen and walked into the house, Kawani made it known that she was lonely. She started with a whimper and progressed to a whine that rose to a full-pitched, frantic howls. Kawani needed a friend who could be with her all the time. 
Kwani was not spoiled. In the wild, a wolf pup never spends a moment alone, without other pack members, for the first six months of her life. Wolves are very social animals. Bruce and Pat knew that leaving Kwani alone was cruel. So, they took turns staying with Kwani. One of them always remained in the pen watching her, petting, playing, or sleeping with her. They knew they couldn't do this forever. Kwani needed a friend who didn't have to leave the pen to answer the phone or cook meals or go to the bathroom. Kwani needed a canine companion. A dog, a member of the same animal family as wolves, would be the perfect playmate for Kwani. In the animal shelter, Pat looked at all the dogs. One dog, number 27, bounced up and down like popcorn. Every time his head appeared, Pat saw a happy grin. At home, she told Bruce about the popcorn dog. We'll go to the animal shelter and see him tomorrow, said Pat. Maybe you'd better call the animal shelter and tell them that we want to see number 27 in the morning, said Bruce. Pat looked at her watch. I'd better hurry. The animal shelter closes in five minutes. It's a good thing you called, said the woman at the animal shelter. We have too many dogs and more just came in. It's sad, but we have to euthanize some. Number 27 is at the top of the list. Well, thank goodness I called, said Pat. We'll be there to pick him up first thing in the morning. Early the next day, Bruce and Pat found a friend to puppy sit Kwani and drove to the animal shelter. As they returned home, number 27 stood between them, wagging his tail and licking their faces. He needs a name, said Pat as she stroked his head. Let's name him after the adventure movie character Indiana Jones, said Bruce. After all, he'll have a wolf for a companion and escaped death with only moments to spare. We'll call him Indy for short. Indy licked their faces. He seemed proud of his new name. When Kuwani saw Indy, she went wild with excitement. Her ears lay flat on her head. She tucked her tail between her legs and licked all over Indy's face. Then she flopped onto her back, whimpering and pawing. With this behavior, she displayed her respect for an older, wiser canine. As you'll see later, Kuwani's way of meeting strange dogs changed dramatically later on when she became an adult. Indy, who was six months older than Kawani, tolerated her puppy silliness. He growled softly and sniffed Kawani thoroughly, all the time holding his tail high. With this behavior, Indy was showing that he was dominant. Kawani thought he was wonderful. Chapter 3. Take a Walk on the Wild Side Human civilization is wild to a wolf. Sidewalks scared Kawani. Bikes frightened her. Cars terrified her. People and dogs are used to seeing planes, fire engines, and trains pass by. To an animal like a wolf, these things are strange and dangerous. Many weeks passed before Bruce and Pat could cross a road without having to drag Kawani. In Kawani's eyes, people who wore backpacks or bicycle helmets were monsters. If she saw such a person, she jerked frantically at the leash and quivered with fear. Walking a wolf is not at all like walking a dog. Anything that didn't scare Kawani needed to be explored. Wolves investigate things with their noses and teeth. On her 60-foot leash, she dashed about and managed to grab things that interest her. Kawani snatched the newspaper from porches and shredded them. She pulled the trash cans and ripped it to pieces. She even enjoyed crushing aluminum cans she discovered in bushes. Once she found an unopened can of soda pop, she rolled the can along the ground while biting at it. Finally, with her needle-sharp baby teeth punctured the can. With a loud hiss, the can spun like a top and sprayed soda pop on Kawani. She jumped back in alarm and then pounced on it with delight, snapping at the spurting sweet liquid. In the wild, wolves are not most active during dawn and dusk, for about four hours a day. The rest of the time, wolves nap or hang out. Kawani was no different. So every day, morning and evening, at dawn and dusk, Pat and Bruce walked Kawani and Indy. Each walk lasted two hours. No matter what, come rain or snow, on Christmas Day or during Saturday morning cartoons, Bruce and Pat walked Kawani. Without her walks, Kawani would have been bored and paced back and forth in her pen or tried to escape. From the age of four to seven months, it became more and more difficult to walk Kawani. She grew at the rate of half a pound each day. Wolves in the wild grow this fast also, and the pup's mother, father, aunts, and uncles have to work hard to feed them. As Kawani grew, her strength increased. During a walk through at a very wet meadow, Bruce watched as Kawani tried to find a deer mice in the tall grass. Without knowing it, Bruce stepped into a loop of Kawani's loose leash. 
Suddenly, Kalani bolted and ran as fast as she could. She had spotted some strange dogs and wanted to chase them out of her territory. The leash tightened, the loop closed around Bruce's legs and jerked them out from beneath him. Kalani was so strong and ran so fast that she dragged Bruce across a swaggy, soggy meadow, feet first and on his back. Water splashed all around him. He looked like a water skier who had fallen but wouldn't let go of the ski rope. Pat and Bruce knew that Kawani needed more than the two walks a day to keep her occupied and happy. They built toys and put them in Kawani's pen. She loved the teeter-totter. By placing her front feet on one end and her back feet on the other end, Kawani learned how to rock back and forth all by herself. In another favorite game, Bruce or Pat covered Kawani with a blanket and played peekaboo. Kawani also delighted in ripping up cardboard boxes, plastic milk jugs, ice cream cartons, and discarded stuffed toys. Every day, the four of them bounced on their Montana trampoline, which they created by placing a piece of plywood on top of four sacks of old tires. At the end of the day, Bruce and Pat fell into bed exhausted. When we take Kawani on her two walks, she's totally out of control, said Pat. How can we ever hope to take her into a classroom? We have to, said Bruce. Kawani is a teacher. She's not a pet. This is a very strange life we've introduced her to. Wolves are used to trees, rivers, mountains, and meadows, not people, streets, buildings, and cars. We'll just have to keep working to get her used to living this way. Chapter 4 What's a nice little wolf like you doing in a place like this? A group of wolves that live together is called a pack. A group of people who live together is called a family. Bruce and Pat's family consisted of themselves, a wolf, and a dog. Kawani's pack consisted of herself, a dog, and two humans. You could say that Bruce and Pat had an odd family, and Kawani lived in a peculiar pack. In a wolf pack, there is an alpha male and female. The alpha wolves are the leaders, or as wildlife biologists call them, the dominant animals. Even though Kawani knew that Pat and Bruce weren't wolves, she saw them as the alpha animals in her pack. Indy was like an older brother to Kawani. Even after she grew to twice Indy's size, Kawani would roll on her back and submit to him. Indy understood his power as an older brother. Sometimes he gathered all the bones in a pile. If Kawani tried to take a bone, Indy growled and snapped at her. He drove her away. Being the oldest didn't make Indy the smartest. Kawani quickly learned he was as easily distracted and could be tricked. For example, she would walk away from Indy in the pile of bones and pretend to find something of great interest in the grass. Indy would rush over to see what she had found. Kawani would then dash through the bone pile and grab one. This often resulted in a noisy fight. Indy would growl and snarl ferociously while Kawani squealed, snapped, and whined. No one ever got hurt badly. Just like the fights between human sisters and brothers, these squabbles were mostly noise. Neither wanted to injure the other. The same is true of wild wolves, most of the time. In addition to the members of her pack, Kawani had three important friends. Chloe Dog Cook, the Great Dane, Elliot Steele, the German Shepherd, and Grey Neil, a human. Kawani met Chloe Dog Cook while out on walks. They became instant friends. At first, Chloe Dog Cook didn't know how to play. Kawani and Indy taught her to wrestle, chase, and play tag. Even after Kawani grew to full size, Chloe Dog Cook was big enough to wrestle her to the ground and pin her. Chloe Dog Cook enjoyed her time with Kawani and Indy so much that she sat beside the window for hours, waiting for them to walk by. Elite Steel was the same as Kawani and also lived nearby. He was a clumsy dog with wobbly legs who lived for one thing, to play. Kawani fell in love with him instantly. She flirted and played hard to get. Their favorite game was chase. With Kawani's ability to make sharp turns and run fast, Elliot Steele never caught her. But to keep him interested, she'd almost let him. Then she shifted into high gear and sped away again. Indy frowned on the fun Elliot Steele and Kawani shared. Indy beat up on Elliot. Elliot Steele thought Indy was playing and considered him a good buddy. Besides Bruce and Pat, Gray was the only other person who could take Kawani on walks. Kawani adored Uncle Gray. He invented toys for her to play with, like bones he hung from a tree limb on a bungee cord. He made pinatas full of dog treats. Because he didn't have to go out on wolf walks every day like Bruce and Pat, Gray allowed Kawani to lead him through the swamps, brambles, and thickets. 
Bruce and Pat tended to get grumpy about such side trips. Kawani had a good memory. Even after she grew up, she remembered people and dogs that she'd met in her puppyhood. She greeted them with enthusiastic muzzle nuzzles, just like the face lick PAX members greet each other with in the wild. Indy also licked faces. Face licking is a wolf behavior that remains in most dogs. Even though some people don't like dogs to lick them, the dog is only trying to act polite. Muzzle licking begins when wolf puppies are four to five weeks old. After a successful hunt, the adult wolves return to the den. Their bellies are swollen with fresh meat as much as 20 pounds. You'd have to eat 60 to 70 hamburgers or more than 100 jumbo hot dogs to put that much meat in your stomach. The puppies rush out to greet the adults, jump, and lick their faces. This causes the adult to throw up or regurgitate, and the pups have a nice hot meal. As the pups mature, face licking becomes the proper way to greet dominant pack members. Face licking is a wolf's way of shaking hands. It's polite canine manners. Once on a walk after she had just eaten, Kwani met two dog puppies that were younger than she was. They looked around her face. Much to their delight, Kwani regurgitated. The pups happily ate the half-digested meal, their tails wagging enthusiastically. Kwani watched with a pleased look on her face. Pat and Bruce didn't feel so happy. The pups were eating five dollars worth of meat meant to nourish Kwani. Chapter 5. Kwani is a good wolf, but she's a bad dog. Even though Kwani was friendly with dogs and other people that she knew, she showed early on that she wasn't a good pet. The first time Bruce and Pat let Kwani in the house, she leaped onto the counter, broke two dinner plates, and spilled a pitcher of milk. From the counter, she sprang onto the table, scattering the silverware, cups, and food. The table tipped over and scared her silly. She drove onto the couch. For 15 seconds, she lay there looking as pleased and contented as a big, lazy dog. Then her yellow eyes focused on the upholstery buttons attached to the backrest of the couch. Pop! 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 With lightning speed, Kawani ripped the buttons off. Pat pulled her off the couch, but not before Kawani managed to shred a pillow and shake it about. As pillow feathers floated down, Pat said, She may be a good wolf, but she's a bad dog. Anybody who thinks that wolves make good pets is crazy. Let's hope she becomes a good teacher, said Bruce. After all, that's why we have her. Sometimes Pat and Bruce brought Indy into the house, but Kawani hated to be left alone, just as she had when she was a puppy. She howled. One of the reasons that wolves howl is to locate other members of their pack. If you were to go on a hike and got separated from the group, you'd shout or whistle to locate others. It doesn't seem fair to never have Indy in the house, said Pat. It's not fair to leave Kawani alone in the pen either, said Bruce, but unless we want our furniture destroyed, she can't be in the house. Wolves don't obey commands like dogs. Plus, she can't be housebroken, said Pat. It's not that wolves are dumb. Kawani urinated in the house to show the places that were hers, or as wildlife biologists say, to mark her territory. Wolves are very territorial. That's another reason they howl, to warn strange wolves to stay out of their territory. Property is what humans call their territory. If strangers walked through your backyard, you might shout at them to leave. I've got an idea, said Pat. We could fence off a part of the living room and build a dog door so that she could come from her outside pen to an inside pen. So that's what Bruce and Pat did. They even dug a tunnel 40 feet long that connected Kiwani's enclosure with their earth-sheltered house. At first, Kawani viewed the swinging dog door with suspicion. After three weeks, she realized it wasn't a trap. Kawani enjoyed being able to check up on her pack members whenever she wanted. Like humans, wolves are naturally social. It's in their nature. They can't help it. Wolves are predators. Therefore, they possess predatory instincts. A predator is an animal that survives by eating other animals. When a predator like a wolf sees an animal run, they instinctively chase to try to kill it. If wild wolves didn't have this instinct, they'd starve to death. After all, there aren't any fast food restaurants or grocery stores in the wild. However, in captivity, the predatory instinct is another reason why wolves are not good pets. A captive wolf learns not to fear people, but will never lose its instincts. A child running and shouting causes the same predatory reaction in a captive wolf 
as would a prey animal. The wolf isn't being mean, it's just the way he or she is made. Because of Kalani's predatory instincts, Pat and Bruce never let her off the leash during walks. It's important to remember, however, that wild wolves are very shy and afraid of people. They have never been a recorded case of a healthy wild wolf killing anyone in North America. As Kawani grew older, she became less submissive and more aggressive to strange dogs. This change in behavior came from the instinct of adult wolves to guard territory. Wild wolves chase wolves that aren't members of their pack out of their territory. Sometimes they even kill trespassers. Another instinct of wolves is that possession of 100% of the law. Bruce and Pat learned that if they tried to take anything away from Kawani, she would bite. Because of this, they worked hard to make sure that she didn't get a hold of anything valuable, but that didn't always work. One night, just after Halloween, Bruce went out to check on Kawani. He petted her and she lay in the straw with her eyes closed, or so it appeared. He set the flashlight down. Suddenly, Kawani snatched the flashlight and dashed away. As she ran in the darkness with the light shining inside her mouth, she looked like a wolf lantern or something from a scary story. Eventually, she lay down and chewed on the flashlight. Bruce slowly reached for the flashlight. Kawani growled. Bruce's fingers touched the light. Faster than a bolt of lightning, Kawani's jaws clamped on his wrist. Obviously, Kawani didn't bite as hard as she would have, or she would have snapped his hand off. Nevertheless, the bite left a big purple bruise. Bruce rolled Kawani on her back and held her down by the ruff while glaring into her eyes. He growled at her. This is how an alpha wolf dominates a pack member, and also the way that dogs dominate each other. After a tense moment, Kawani relaxed and looked away. The fight was over. Bruce released her. She stood up, whined softly, and licked his face. He petted and reassured her. In some ways, Kawani and Indy behaved alike. For example, like Kawani, Indy licked faces to show submission and to beg for attention. He chased rabbits and squirrels to mark territory by urinating, buried bones, and became upset when strange canines entered his territory. Nevertheless, they also acted quite different. Dog's ancestors are wolves, but for 15,000 years, dogs have been specifically bred to live with people. Dogs that disobey or bite people were killed. People only allowed dogs who obeyed commands to have puppies. Eventually, dogs lost many of the instincts that make a wolf a bad companion for humans. Breeding animals tend to behave and look the way that we want them to. It's called domestication. Indy was domesticated. You could call him, or any dog, a domesticated wolf. Though Kawani behaved in a tame manner around people, she was wild at heart and couldn't be expected to act like a dog. One look into Kawani's piercing yellow eyes could convince you she was not domesticated. Bruce and Pat thought about how much their lives had changed since Kawani entered the picture. They'd had an expensive pen built on an acre of their land and fenced off part of their living room for a wolf. They couldn't go away together after all. There weren't any wolf sitters in the phone book. They'd both given up jobs to devote their time to preparing Kawani for classroom visits. They'd hope it would work. Chapter 6. How does a wolf get ready for school? If Kawani was going to visit schools, the first thing she had to get used to was traveling inside her kennel in the van. No matter how much time Pat or Bruce spent trying, Kawani refused to enter the van without a struggle. Sometimes she even bit them to express her frustration. Indy, on the other hand, leaped into the van as soon as the door opened. He wanted to make sure to get his place on the bus. Kawani never overcame her dislike of vehicles. She demonstrated in every way possible that if travel was necessary, she'd just as soon walk. To people, there's nothing unusual about doors, but to Kawani, doors look dangerous. It took two weeks for Kawani to realize a door wasn't a trap. The next step was taking her inside a building. During the summer, when the students weren't there, Bruce and Pat got permission to enter the elementary school down the road from them. Pat opened the school door. Indy dashed inside. Kawani sniffed the entryway and followed cautiously. The hard, polished floor felt strange and slippery to her feet. With her tail tucked between her legs, she stood still and suspiciously eyed the hallway. Pat slowly closed the door. Filled with panic, Kawani whirled around and scratched at the door. Bruce petted and reassured her. Then she saw Indy at the end of the hall, his nose in a trash can. Her ears perked up. 
Kalani walked towards Indy with her legs spread apart so that she wouldn't slip. For the next few weeks, they explored the school. They ran up and down stairs, knocked over trash cans, chased basketballs in the gymnasium, and even tried out the fire escape. The fire escape stairs were made of metal gratings, which meant that you could see through them down to the ground. Surprisingly, this scared Indy, but not Kalani. The first time Kalani investigated at a drinking fountain, she jumped back in alarm when Bruce turned on the water. In a classroom, Kalani licked the chalkboard. Then she noticed an eraser. She grabbed it and dashed away, running through the aisles between rows of desks with Indy in hot pursuit. Finally, the game ended after Kalani tore the eraser to shreds. Pat and Bruce left a note and money for a new eraser, hoping that the teacher would understand when she returned to her classroom in the fall. Kalani stalked back and forth through the aisles of the seats in the auditorium. To her delight, she discovered a treasure stuck to the bottom of a chair. With her front teeth, she carefully plucked the wad of pink gum and chewed it in preparation to swallow. But no matter how much she chewed, the gum never broke apart. Finally, she spit it out and looked for a fresh piece. Forever after, when Kalani first entered the auditorium, she searched the bottom of chairs for gum. With each new adventure, Bruce and Pat noticed something. Kawani waited for Indy to take the lead. When he showed her no fear, she followed. Indy was more than a good friend to Kawani. As a dog, he didn't fear new things the way a wolf would. This meant that Indy could lead Kawani into places where she wouldn't have ventured without him. Another step in preparing Kawani to be a teacher was making her feel comfortable around strangers. On walks, if people showed interest, Bruce and Pat asked them to kneel and let Kawani approach. Eventually, Kawani sniffed the people and licked their faces. Even after she became an adult, Kawani greeted new people in this friendly manner. Once, as Kawani licked a woman's cheek, the woman said, It looks a lot like a wolf. Well, she is, said Bruf. The woman froze in fear. Wolves are dangerous, aren't they? You're not in any danger, said Bruce. By licking your face, Kawani is telling you that she isn't a threat. Besides, you put yourself in more danger driving to the store than you would walking through a forest full of wolves. As they talked, the woman slowly relaxed. By the time in, the woman stood up to leave, she had a new attitude about wolves. Kawani had taught her her first lesson as a teacher. After hundreds of hours of working with Kawani, Bruce and Pat decided they'd done all that they could to prepare her for her first school program. A big question remained. How would Kawani react to being inside a classroom full of strangers? Chapter 7. The Big Day. Kawani Goes to School. And of course, so does Indy. In a small Montana town, Bruce parked the van in front of the school. Beside him, Pat starred out the window but didn't speak. To the west, snow-covered mountains rose behind tall pine trees. Cattle gazed behind barbed-wire fences. Inside the van, Kawani paced nervously. Indy lay peacefully on his pad atop the storage box. Finally, Bruce and Pat looked at each other. How do you think Kawani will act, said Pat. Do you think she'll panic once we get inside with all the students? We'll never know until we do it, said Bruce. They climbed out of the van and walked to the classroom. 32 fourth graders enthusiastically greeted Bruce and Pat. Where's the wolf? A student called out. Are we really going to see a real wolf? Asked another. Will the wolf bite us? The teacher quieted the students and the program began. Pat, the wildlife biologist, explains to the class how wolves live together, what they eat, how pups are raised, and what they need to survive. Bruce, the writer and storyteller, told the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Then he said, All stories, even make-believe tales, contain lessons. What's the real lesson in Little Red Riding Hood? You're all smart enough to know that it isn't a story about avoiding wolves that dress up in nightgowns. This is a story about obedience, self-discipline, and doing what your parents tell you to do. Little Red Riding Hood did two things her mother told her not to do. She stepped off the straight and narrow trail to pick flowers for Grandma and spoke to a stranger. The wolf in the story plays the role of a stranger, just like actors play roles in movies. The wolf also plays the role of a villain in other stories such as The Three Little Pigs, Peter and the Wolf, or movies such as Beauty and the Beast. Finally, the time arrived to introduce Kalani. Remember to keep her on a tight leash, whispered Pat, and be prepared for students to try to reach out and touch her. While Bruce headed for the van to get Kalani, Pat spoke to the class. Think of how you would feel if you walked into a strange place filled with wolves. 
A nervous laugh came from the students. How would you want them to act? Pat asked. A girl said, I'd want them to be quiet and sit still. Well, that's exactly how Kalani will want you to act, said Pat. Another student blurted out, Can we pat her? I'm sorry, but you can't. I know that would be fun, but you need to think about how you'd feel if 32 strangers started petting you. And keep in mind, Kalani will be doing many more programs like this. In fact, she's doing another program at our community hall tonight. Through the window, Pat could see Bruce, Kalani, and Indy coming through the door. Pat had one more thing to tell the children. Please show Kalani respect and remember she's a teacher, not a pet. There's many times when Bruce and I feel sad about having her in captivity. In a perfect world, all wolves would want to free in the, in the wild. But in a perfect world, there wouldn't be people who killed wolves just because they hated or feared them. Hate and fear usually come from not understanding something. Kwani's job is to teach people the truth about wolves and show them that wolves aren't monsters. The door opened. Andy bounded into the room with his tail wagging and a happy grin on his face. The children giggled and laughed. Now watch the difference in how Kwani enters, said Pat. A magic hush fell over the children. They stared wide-eyed as Kwani entered, calm dignity, her yellow eyes blazing with curiosity. With Bruce and Tell, Kwani circled the room. A boy announced in a frightened voice, It's a black wolf! They're the most vicious kind! Black, gray, tan, and white pups can all be born in the same litter, said Bruce. Just like in a human family, brothers and sisters can have different colored hair and eyes. The color of a wolf tells you nothing about its behavior. The same with people. At the front of the classroom, Kawani followed Indy and jumped on the top where everybody could see her better. Pat asked the teacher to come forward. Kawani licked the teacher's face in the student's lap. The teacher put a few toys on the table. Kawani picked out a plastic doll and chewed on it. She snipped off an arm and next the legs. The children pointed and laughed. Uh, this is another reason that wolves don't make good pets, said Pat. Wolves would treat your new toys just like bones or an old stick. Pat and Bruce answered the questions and then concluded the program. For a long time, people in the United States trapped, poisoned, and shot wolves. They wanted to exterminate wolves and they succeeded. For 50 years, we didn't have wolf packs running wild in the Northwest. Now, wolves have traveled down from Canada to live in the Rocky and Cascade Mountains. Whether or not they're successful depends on people's attitudes. The West is settled. The frontier is tamed. Can we allow wolves a place to live? Can we tolerate a little wildness? The decision is yours. They loaded Kalani in the van. She paced around inside her kennel and then lay down on the straw. Bruce and Pat sighed with relief and gave each other a high five. We did it, said Bruce. Kawani was great. You know that saying about a picture being worth a thousand words, said Pat? Well, showing these students Kawani was worth a thousand pictures. No television documentary or book could ever be as powerful as the presence of a living animal. All the time they'd spent to prepare Kawani for the classroom visit had paid off. The day isn't over yet, said Bruce. There will be a lot of grown-ups who hate wolves at tonight's program. In the community hall, Pat and Bruce looked around them. Hecklers rudely interrupted the program. People wearing cowboy hats held protest signs that proclaimed, Three S's, shoot, shovel, and shut up. And no wolves, no way. Their hatred of wolves filled the room with so much tension that the people who liked wolves were scared to admit it. Maybe we shouldn't bring Kawani in, whispered Pat. Some of these people are very mad about wolves. They might hurt her. A man wearing a camouflage-colored cap jumped to his feet. Wolves are nature's criminals, he screamed. She's probably safer in here with us than she is alone in the van, said Bruce, and he walked out to get her. Kawani entered the room, and all but the most rude people quieted it down. They watched her with interest. The man wearing a camo-colored cap stood up again. He shouted, Big deal! That animal is tame! A real wolf would have killed somebody by now! The girl next to the man rose to her feet. One hundred and fifty people quieted as the twelve-year-old nervously cleared her throat. There are adults who will never learn anything. The red-faced man glared at her. She looked straight ahead. Thank you for coming to the Swan Valley with Kiwani. We children can learn for ourselves about wolves. We can make up our own minds. Her courage inspired the people who liked wolves. Applause filled the room. 
The noise caused Kawani to stop chewing on the stuffed toy and stare at the audience. Her eyes looked into the eyes of those who liked wolves and those who did not. Kawani had truly become a teacher. Appendix. Commonly asked questions. What can I do to help wolves? There are two main things you can do to help wolves. You can write to people who represent you in the federal and state governments. Tell them what you think about wolves. The most important thing you can do is to learn more about wolves. Talk to friends, relatives, neighbors, and family about wolves and let them know what wolves are really like. Many children think that they're too young for their words to make any difference. That's not true. Remember the story of the brave girl who spoke out in the community hall? She inspired confidence and courage in grown-ups who were frightened to admit that they liked wolves. Her words made a difference. When you learn about things and speak out, you influence the people around you far more than you might think. If I want a wolf of my own, what should I do? Wolves don't make good pets. As you can tell from Kalani's story, Pat and Bruce spent a lot of time with her every day. Not only that, they founded a nonprofit organization, Wild Century, dedicated to environmental education. They spend lots of money to build their enclosure. In addition, Kwani isn't a pet, she's a teacher. That's why Ruth and Pat agreed to raise her, so they could teach people about the true nature of her brothers and sisters in the wild. If you really, really want to be in the company of wolves, there are zoos and wolf sanctuaries, education centers, and research organizations you can work or volunteer for. When was Kwani born? Kwani was born in captivity on May 5, 1991. She's a Cinco de Mayo baby. Unlike dogs, all wolves have their birthdays in April or May. Indy is six months older than Kwani. What kind of wolf is Kawani? Kawani is a gray wolf. There are two types of wolves, the gray wolf and the red wolf. Gray wolves inhabited most of North America from the Pacific to the Atlantic coast and from Alaska clear down to southern Mexico. They also lived in most of Europe and Asia. Humans have dramatically reduced the range of gray wolves. Most of them now live in Alaska, Canada, and Siberia. Red wolves historically lived in the southeastern United States. Most red wolves now live in zoos, except for a few wild ones in North Carolina. In different parts of the country, people call the gray wolf a timber wolf, a buffalo wolf, or an arctic wolf. Do wolf-dog hybrids make good pets? Wolf-dog hybrids are part wolf and part dog. Most hybrids don't make good pets. A hybrid can have the traits of a dog that make it less fearful of people mixed with the instinctive predatory traits of the wolf. Such a mix can be a recipe for disaster. Unfortunately, no one can tell until the hybrid is an adult whether it will be dangerous and hard to handle. Most hybrids are dead by the time they are two years old. By that time, the hybrid is likely to have been killed by someone else rather than it has escaped and caused trouble. If it hasn't been killed, the owner has probably discovered that the animal is not a good pet. The owner then may euthanize the animal or turn it loose to the woods, where it will starve to death because it has never learned to hunt. Is Indy part wolf? What kind of dog is Indy? No, Indy is not a wolf. He is pure dog. Because he came from the animal shelter, Bruce and Pat don't know exactly what kind of dog he is. They call him a big sky snow roller. Can Kawani have puppies? Kawani has been neutered so that she can't have puppies. There are many people who breed and sell wolves. Unfortunately, most people who get a wolf never stop to really think about the responsibilities they were taking on. After it's too late, they realize that wolves don't make good pets. They are too many wolves in captivity, and most of them end up dead before the age of two. Bruce and Pat don't want to contribute to that problem. Do wolves get married? Before wolves mate and have babies, they go through courtship and decide whether or not they like each other. After they have pups, the male and female wolves often stay together until one of them dies. They don't have weddings with fancy clothes, gifts, and a minister like humans do, so you'll have to decide for yourself if wolves are married or not. Are wild wolves dangerous to people? There's never been a documented case of a healthy wild wolf killing anyone in North America. This isn't to say that they have never have or never will kill a human, but a such occurrence would be very rare. We do have documented cases of deer killing people with their antlers or hooves every year, and yet people aren't scared of deer. You're in far more danger driving down the road in a car than you ever would be in the wolves, no matter what kind of predators live there.
What kind of fence does Kawani have? Two fences surround Kawani's enclosure. The outer fence is 8 feet high. Four feet from it, there's another fence that's 10 feet high. The outer fence stops people from reaching into Kawani's pen. The inner fence keeps Kawani in her enclosure. There's also a four-foot skirt of fencing buried at the base of the inner fence to keep Kawani from digging her way out. What does Kawani eat? Kawani eats two to three pounds of raw meat every day. The meat is usually deer or elk. Pat and Bruce get scrap meat from the butcher shop during the hunting season. Kwani also eat as much of the high-quality dry dog food. Does Kwani hunt? Being on a 60-foot leash allows Kwani to move around a lot. She often catches mice and voles. She also has caught grouse, rabbits, squirrels, and even a muskrat. Is Kwani ever off-leash when she is on a walk? No, but not because she'd run away. Bruce and Pat are her pack, and even if she got off leash, Kawani would return to them. She is on a leash or in her pen because wolves can't be trained to obey commands. If Kawani ran loose, she might hurt pets or small children. Could Kawani ever be released in the wild? There are three main reasons why releasing Kawani would be irresponsible and cruel. First, Kawani is used to being around people and sees them as providers of food. If she were dropped off in the wilderness, she would travel until she found people. People might shoot her out of fear or because Kawani chased their pets or livestock. Second, if that didn't happen, she'd starve to death. Wolves learn hunting techniques from their packs. No one has taught Kawani how to hunt big animals. Third, Kawani could not join another pack. If she met up with a pack, they would chase her away or kill her. Why wouldn't a pack of wolves adopt Kawani? A pack of wolves is a family. They're all related. Think of your family gathered at the table to eat dinner. If a stranger walked in and started taking things out of your refrigerator, what would your family do? How do new packs get started? Some wolves stay with their family all their lives. Other teenage, 10 to 24 month old, wolves decide to leave their family and home territory. This is called dispersal. Dispersing wolves can travel 500 miles, but usually they travel less than 100 miles. When they find a place that doesn't already have a wolf pack, they stop traveling. There they wait in hopes of meeting and liking a dispersing wolf from another pack. If they do, they have pups together and a new pack begins. When are the pups born? Wolves mate in late February and give birth to four to six pups 62 to 63 days later in April or May. Pups spend the first two to three weeks with their mother. After that, the pups crawl out of their den and the entire pack helps raise them. They begin hunting with the pack when they're around six months old. How fast can wolves run? For a short sprint, wolves can run 35 to 40 miles per hour. They can trot or lope along at five miles an hour for hours on end and can travel 120 miles a day. How strong are the jaws of a wolf? Wolves need strong jaws to catch their prey. The jaws of a wolf have a crushing power of 1,500 pounds per square inch, compared to a German Shepherd with 750 pounds per square inch. The jaws of a wolf are stronger than any dog's. Strong jaws also allow wolves to crush bones to get at the nutritious marrow. How much do wolves weigh? Most wolves weigh somewhere between 70 and 120 pounds. Male weighs about 10% more than females. Sometimes, as with humans, there is an exceptionally large wolf. The largest wolf ever found was from Alaska and weighed 165 pounds. At 100 pounds, Kwani is a large female. When are wolves adults? Wolves reach full size when they are 8 to 10 months old. They usually don't breed until they are at least 22 months old. How long do wolves live? Wild wolves usually don't live much longer than 8 or 9 years. The reason they don't live longer is because that by that age, they have arthritis from being kicked by prey animals and their teeth are broken and worn down. These things happen. They can't get enough to eat when they starve. In captivity, wolves die of old age between 13 and 17 years. Do wolves ever eat other wolves? While it's not uncommon for wolves to kill other wolves from strange packs, they usually don't eat them. However, if they are extremely hungry, they sometimes do. Just like people, wolves have been known to eat their own kind, though it's very rare. Where do wolves live? 
Wolves can live in almost any environment as long as there are plenty of prey animals. They used to live in forests, plains, tundra, and deserts. The only place they didn't do well are high mountains, tropical swampy areas, and extreme deserts, probably because that wasn't enough to eat for them in those places. Wolves used to live all over North America. How come there aren't very many of them in the lower 48 states now? Wolves all over North America were poisoned and trapped until they were exterminated for most of the lower 48 states by the late 1930s. This was done because they killed livestock. One reason they did this was that people killed most of the native prey, such as the bison and elk, so wolves didn't have anything else to eat. People also killed wolves because they believed the bad stories they'd heard about them. What do wolves need to survive? Wolves need two main things to survive. They need to be safe from people killing them. Most important, they need habitat. Habitat is the area that is everything an animal needs to survive. A wolf's habitat must support large numbers of prey animals. If people keep building homes in all the valleys, there won't be places for the prey animals to spend the winter. When prey animals disappear, the wolves won't have anything to eat.